Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka, July 3, 1883, June 3, 1924, was a German-speaking Bohemian Jewish novelist and short story writer, widely regarded as one of the major figures of 20th century literature. His work, which fuses elements of realism and the fantastic, typically features isolated protagonists faced by bizarre or surrealistic predicaments and incomprehensible social bureaucratic powers, and has been interpreted as exploring themes of alienation, existential anxiety, guilt, and absurdity. His best-known works include, The Metamorphosis, The Trial, and, The Castle. The term has entered the English language to describe situations like those in his writing. Kafka was born into a middle-class, German-speaking Jewish family in Prague, the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, today the capital of the Czech Republic. He trained as a lawyer, and after completing his legal education he was employed by an insurance company, forcing him to relegate writing to his spare time. Over the course of his life, Kafka wrote hundreds of letters to family and close friends, including his father, with whom he had a strained and formal relationship. He became engaged to several women but never married. He died in 1924 at the age of 40 from tuberculosis. Few of Kafka's works were published during his lifetime The Story Collections, Contemplation, and A Country Doctor, and Individual Stories, such as, were published in literary magazines but received little public attention. Kafka's unfinished works, including his novels, and translated as both America and the Man Who Disappeared, were ordered by Kafka to be destroyed by his friend Max Brod, who nonetheless ignored his friend's direction and published them after Kafka's death. His work went on to influence a vast range of writers, critics, artists, and philosophers during the 20th century. Kafka was born near the Old Town Square in Prague, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His family were German-speaking middle-class Ashkenazi Jews. His father, Hermann Kafka, 1854 to 1931, was the fourth child of Jacob Kafka, a or ritual slaughterer in Osek, a Czech village with a large Jewish population located near Strakonice in southern Bohemia. Hermann brought the Kafka family to Prague. After working as a traveling sales representative, he eventually became a fashion retailer who employed up to 15 people and used the image of a jackdaw, in Czech, pronounced and colloquially written as Kafka as his business logo. Kafka's mother, Julie, 1856 to 1934, was the daughter of Jacob Lowy, a prosperous retail merchant in Podibrod, and was better educated than her husband. Kafka's parents probably spoke a German influence by Yiddish that was sometimes pejoratively called Mauschel Deutsch, but, as the German language was considered the vehicle of social mobility, they probably encouraged their children to speak standard German. Hermann and Julie had six children, of whom Franz was the eldest. Franz's two brothers, Georg and Heinrich, died in infancy before Franz was seven. His three sisters were Gabrielle, Ellie 1889-1944, Valerie, Valley 1890-1942, and Ottilie, Otla 1892-1943. They all died during the Holocaust of World War II. Valley was deported to the Wuj ghetto and occupied Poland in 1942, but that is the last documentation of her. Ottilie was his favorite sister. Herman is described by the biographer Stanley Korngold as a huge, selfish, overbearing businessman and by Franz Kafka as a true Kafka in strength, health, appetite, loudness of voice, eloquence, self-satisfaction, worldly dominance, endurance, presence of mind, and, knowledge of human nature. On business days, both parents were absent from the home, with Julie Kafka working as many as 12 hours each day helping to manage the family business. Consequently, Kafka's childhood was somewhat lonely, and the children were reared largely by a series of governesses and servants. Kafka's troubled relationship with his father is evident in his letter to his father, of more than 100 pages, in which he complains of being profoundly affected by his father's authoritarian and demanding character. His mother, in contrast, was quiet and shy. The dominating figure of Kafka's father had a significant influence on Kafka's writing. The Kafka family had a servant girl living with them in a cramped apartment. Franz's room was often cold. In November 1913 the family moved into a bigger apartment, although Ellie and Valley had married and moved out of the first apartment. In early August 1914, just after World War I began, the sisters did not know where their husbands were in the military and moved back in with the family in this larger apartment. Both Ellie and Valley also had children. Franz at age 31 moved into Valley's former apartment, 
quiet by contrast, and lived by himself for the first time. From 1889 to 1893, Kafka attended the German boys' elementary school at the Meat Market, now known as Masna Street. His Jewish education ended with his bar mitzvah celebration at the age of 13. Kafka never enjoyed attending the synagogue and went with his father only on four high holidays a year. After leaving elementary school in 1893, Kafka was admitted to the rigorous classics oriented state gymnasium, an academic secondary school at Old Town Square within the Kinsky Palace. German was the language of instruction, but Kafka also spoke and wrote in Czech. He studied the latter at the gymnasium for eight years, achieving good grades. Although Kafka received compliments for his Czech, he never considered himself fluent in Czech, though he spoke German with a Czech accent. He completed his mature exams in 1901. Admitted to the of Prague in 1901, Kafka began studying chemistry, but switched to law after two weeks. Although this field did not excite him, it offered a range of career possibilities which pleased his father. In addition, law required a longer course of study, giving Kafka time to take classes in German studies and art history. He also joined a student club, reading and lecture hall of the German students, which organized literary events, readings and other activities. Among Kafka's friends were the journalist Felix Welch, who studied philosophy the actor Yitzhak Lowy who came from an orthodox Hasidic Warsaw family, and the writers Oscar Baum and Franz Verfeld. At the end of his first year of studies, Kafka met Max Brod, a fellow law student who became a close friend for life. Brod soon noticed that, although Kafka was shy and seldom spoke, what he said was usually profound. Kafka was an avid reader throughout his life, together he and Brod read Plato's Protagoras in the original Greek, on Brod's initiative, and Flaubert's end. The Temptation of Saint Anthony, in French, at his own suggestion. Kafka considered Fyodor Dostoevsky, Flaubert, Nikolai Gogol, Franz Grillparza, and Heinrich von Kleist to be his true blood brothers. Besides these, he took an interest in Czech literature and was also very fond of the works of Gouda. Kafka was awarded the degree of Doctor of Law on 18 July 1906 and performed an obligatory year of unpaid service as law clerk for the civil and criminal courts. On November 1, 1907, Kafka was hired at the, an insurance company, where he worked for nearly a year. His correspondence during that period indicates Thaith was unhappy with a working time schedule, from 8 o'clock until 1800 hours, making it extremely difficult to concentrate on writing, which was assuming increasing importance to him. On July 15, 1908, he resigned. Two weeks later he found employment more amenable to writing when he joined the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute for the Kingdom of Bohemia. The job involved investigating and assessing compensation for personal injury to industrial workers, accidents such as lost fingers or limbs were commonplace at this time owing to poor work safety policies at the time. It was especially true of factories fitted with machine lathes, drills, planing machines and rotary saws which were rarely fitted with safety guards. The management professor Peter Drucker credits Kafka with developing the first civilian hard hat while employed at the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute, but this is not supported by any document from his employer. His father often referred to his son's job as an insurance officer as a, literally bread job, a job done only to pay the bills, Kafka often claimed to despise it. Kafka was rapidly promoted and his duties included processing and investigating compensation claims, writing reports, and handling appeals from businessmen who thought their firms had been placed in too high a risk category, which cost them more in insurance premiums. He would compile and compose the annual report on the Insurance Institute for the several years he worked there. The reports were received well by his superiors. Kafka usually got off work at 2 p.m., so that he had time to spend on his literary work to which he was committed. Kafka's father also expected him to help out at and take over the family fancy goods store. In his later years, Kafka's illness often prevented him from working at the insurance bureau and at his writing. Years later, Broad coined the term, the Close Prague Circle, to describe the group of writers, which included Kafka, Felix Welch and him. In late 1911, Ellie's husband Karl Hermann and Kafka became partners in the first asbestos factory in Prague, known as Prager Asbest Work Hermann and Company, having used dowry money from Hermann Kafka. Kafka showed a positive attitude at first, dedicating much of his free time to the business, but he later resented the encroachment of this work on his writing time. During that period, he also found interest and entertainment in the performance as off Yiddish theater. After seeing a Yiddish theater troupe perform in October 1911, 
For the next six months Kafka immersed himself in Yiddish language and in Yiddish literature. This interest also served as a starting point for his growing exploration of Judaism. It was at about this time that Kafka became a vegetarian. Around 1915, Kafka received his draft notice for military service in World War I, but his employers at the Insurance Institute arranged for a deferment because this work was considered essential government service. Later, he attempted to join the military but was prevented from doing so by medical problems associated with tuberculosis, with which he was diagnosed in 1917. In 1918 the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute put Kafka on a pension due to his illness, for which there was no cure at the time, and he spent most of the rest of his life in sanatoriums. Kafka never married. According to Brod, Kafka was tortured by sexual desire and Kafka's biographer Reiner Stach states that his life was full of incessant womanizing and that he was filled with the fear of sexual failure. He visited brothels for most of his adult life and was interested in pornography. In addition, he had close relationships with several women during his life. On August 13, 1912, Kafka met Felice Bauer, a relative of Broad, who worked in Berlin as a representative of a dictaphone company. A week after the meeting at Broad's home, Kafka wrote in his diary. Shortly after this, Kafka wrote the story, The Judgment, in only one night and worked in a productive period on, The Man Who Disappeared, and Die Verwandlung, The Metamorphosis. Kafka and Felice Bauer communicated mostly through letters over the next five years, met occasionally, and were engaged twice. Kafka's extant letters to her were published as, Letters to Felice, Her Letters Do Not Survive. According to biographers Stach and James Hawes, around 1920 Kafka was engaged a third time, to Julie War Isaac, a poor and uneducated hotel chambermaid. Although the two rented a flat and set a wedding date, the marriage never took place. During this time Kafka began a draft of the letter to his father, who objected to Julie because of her Zionist beliefs. Before the date of the intended marriage, he took up with yet another woman. While he needed women and sex in his life, he had low self-confidence, felt sex was dirty, and was shy, especially about his body. Stach and Broad state that during the time that Kafka knew Felice Bauer, he had an affair with a friend of hers, Margaret Greta Bloch, a Jewish woman from Berlin. Broad says that Bloch gave birth to Kafka's son, although Kafka never knew about the child. The boy, whose name is not known, was born in 1914 or 1915 and died in Munich in 1921. However, Kafka's biographer Peter Andre Alt claims that, while Bloch had a son, Kafka was not the father as the pair were never intimate. Stach states that Bloch had a son, but there is not solid proof and moreover contradictory evidence that Kafka was the father. Kafka was diagnosed with tuberculosis in August 1917 and moved for a few months to the Bohemian village of Zorel, Syram in the Czech language, where his sister Atla worked on the farm of her brother-in-law Karl Hermann. He felt comfortable there and later described this time as perhaps the best time in his life, probably because he had no responsibilities. He kept diaries and, Octavo. From the notes in these books, Kafka extracted 109 numbered pieces off text on Zettel single pieces of paper in no given order. They were later published as, the Zurao aphorisms or reflections on sin, hope, suffering, and the true way. In 1920 Kafka began an intense relationship with Milena Jesenska, a Czech journalist and writer. His letters to her were later published as, during a vacation in July 1923 to Graalmoritz on the Baltic Sea, Kafka met Dora Diamond a 25-year-old kindergarten teacher from an Orthodox Jewish family. Kafka, hoping to escape the influence of his family to concentrate on his writing, moved briefly to Berlin and lived with Diamond. She became his lover and caused him to become interested in the Talmud. He worked on four stories, which he prepared to be published as, a hunger artist. Kafka feared that people would find him mentally and physically repulsive. However, those who met him found him to possess a quiet and cool demeanor obvious intelligence, and a dry sense of humor, they also found him boyishly handsome, although of austere appearance. Broad compared Kafka to Heinrich von Kleist, noting that both writers had the ability to describe a situation realistically with precise details. Broad thought Kafka was one of the most entertaining people he had met, Kafka enjoyed sharing humor with his friends, but also helped them in difficult situations with good advice. According to Broad, he was a passionate reciter, who was able to phrase his speaking as if it were music. Broad felt that two of Kafka's most distinguishing traits were absolute truthfulness and precise conscientiousness. He explored details, the inconspicuous, in depth and with such love and precision that things surfaced that were unforeseen, 
seemingly strange, but absolutely true. Although Kafka showed little interest in exercise as a child, he later showed interest in games and physical activity, as a good rider, swimmer, and rower. On weekends he and his friends embarked on long hikes, often planned by Kafka himself. His other interests included alternative medicine, modern education systems such as Montessori, and technical novelties such as airplanes and film. Writing was important to Kafka, he considered it a form of prayer. He was highly sensitive to noise and preferred quiet when writing. Perez Alvarez has claimed that Kafka may have possessed a schizoid personality disorder. His style, it is claimed, not only in Die Verwandlung, The Metamorphosis, but in various other writings, appears to show low to medium level schizoid traits, which explain much of his work. His anguish can be seen in this diary entry from June 21, 1913. And in Zurau Aphorism No. 50. Though Kafka never married, he held marriage and children in high esteem. He had several girlfriends. He may have suffered from an eating disorder. Dr. Manfred M. Victor of the Psychiatric Clinic, University of Munich, presented evidence for the hypothesis that the writer Franz Kafka had suffered from an atypical anorexia nervosa, and that Kafka was not just lonely and depressed but also occasionally suicidal. In his 1995 book Franz Kafka, The Jewish Patient, Sander Gilman investigated why a Jew might have been considered hypochondriac or homosexual and how Kafka incorporates aspects of these ways of understanding the Jewish male into his own self-image and writing. Kafka considered committing suicide at least once, in late 1912. Prior to World War I, Kafka attended several meetings of the Club Mladic, a Czech anarchist, anti-militarist, and anti-clerical organization. Hugo Bergman, who attended the same elementary and high schools as Kafka, fell out with Kafka during their last academic year, 1900-1901, because, Kafka's socialism and my Zionism were much too strident. Franz became a socialist, I became a Zionist in 1898. The synthesis of Zionism and socialism did not yet exist. Bergman claims that Kafka wore a red carnation to school to show his support for socialism. In one diary entry, Kafka made reference to the influential anarchist philosopher Peter Kropotkin, don't forget Kropotkin. During the communist era, the legacy of Kafka's work for Eastern Bloc socialism was hotly debated. Opinions ranged from the notion that he satirized the bureaucratic bungling of a crumbling Austria-Hungarian empire, to the belief that he embodied the rise of socialism. A further key point was Marx's theory of alienation. While the orthodox position was that Kafka's depictions of alienation were no longer relevant for a society that had supposedly eliminated alienation, a 1963 conference held in Liblis, Czechoslovakia, on the 80th anniversary of his birth, reassessed the importance of Kafka's portrayal of bureaucracy. Whether or not Kafka was a political writer is still an issue of debate. Kafka grew up in Prague as a German speaking Jew. He was deeply fascinated by the Jews of Eastern Europe, who he thought possessed an intensity of spiritual life that was absent from Jews in the West. His diary is full of references to Yiddish writers. Yet he was at times alienated from Judaism and Jewish life. What have I in common with Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself and should stand very quietly in a corner, content that I can breathe. In his adolescent years, Kafka had declared himself an atheist. Hawes suggests that Kafka, though very aware of his own Jewishness, did not incorporate it into his work, which, according to Hawes, lacks Jewish characters, scenes or themes. In the opinion of literary critic Harold Bloom, although Kafka was uneasy with his Jewish heritage, he was the quintessential Jewish writer. Lothar Kahn is likewise unequivocal, the presence of Jewishness in Kafka's is no longer subject to doubt. Parvleisner, one of Kafka's first translators, interprets, the trial, as the embodiment of the triple dimension of Jewish existence in Prague. His protagonist Joseph K. is, symbolically, arrested by a German, Rabensteiner, a Czech, Kulich, and a Jew, Kaminer. He stands for the guiltless guilt that imbues the Jew in the modern world, although there is no evidence that he himself is a Jew. In his essay Sadness in Palestine, Dan Miron explores Kafka's connection to Zionism. It seems that those who claim that there was such a connection and had Zionism played a central role in his life and literary work, and those who deny the connection altogether or dismiss its importance, are both wrong. The truth lies in some very elusive place between these two simplistic poles. Kafka considered moving to Palestine with Felice Bauer, and later with Dora Diamond. He studied Hebrew while living in Berlin, hiring a friend of Brod's from Palestine, 
Pooh Batavim, to tutor him and attending Rabbi Julius Gruntel's and Rabbi Julius Gutman's classes in the Berlin College for the Study of Judaism. Livia Rothkirchen calls Kafka the symbolic figure of his era. His contemporaries included numerous Jewish, Czech, and German writers who were sensitive to Jewish, Czech, and German culture. According to Rothkirchen, this situation lent their writings a broad cosmopolitan outlook and a quality of exaltation bordering on transcendental metaphysical contemplation. An illustrious example is Franz Kafka. Towards the end of his life Kafka sent a postcard to his friend Hugo Bergman in Tel Aviv, announcing his intention to emigrate to Palestine. Bergman refused to host Kafka because he had young children and was afraid that Kafka would infect them with tuberculosis. Kafka's laryngeal tuberculosis worsened and in March 1924 he returned from Berlin to Prague, where members of his family, principally his sister Atla, took care of him. He went to Dr. Hoffman's sanatorium in Kirling just outside Vienna for treatment on 10th of April, and died there on June 3, 1924. The cause of death seemed to be starvation, the condition of Kafka's throat made eating too painful for him, and since parenteral nutrition had not yet been developed, there was no way to feed him. Kafka was editing a hunger artist on his deathbed, a story whose composition he had begun before his throat closed to the point that he could not take any nourishment. His body was brought back to Prague where he was buried on June 11, 1924, in the new Jewish cemetery in Prague-Zizkov. Kafka was virtually unknown during his own lifetime, but he did not consider fame important. He rose to fame rapidly after his death, particularly after World War II. The Kafka tombstone was designed by architect Leopold Ehrman. All of Kafka's published works, except some letters he wrote in Czech to Milena Jesenska, were written in German. What little was published during his lifetime attracted scant public attention. Kafka finished none of his full-length novels and burned around 90% of his work, much of it during the period he lived in Berlin with Diamond, who helped him burn the drafts. In his early years as a writer, he was influenced by von Kleist, whose work he described in a letter to Bauer as frightening, and whom he considered closer than his own family. Kafka's earliest published works were eight stories which appeared in 1908 in the first issue of the literary journal Hyperion under the title, Contemplation. He wrote the story, Description of a Struggle, in 1904, he showed it to Broad in 1905 who advised him to continue writing and convinced him to submit it to Hyperion. Kafka published a fragment in 1908 and two sections in the spring of 1909, all in Munich. In a creative outburst on the night of September 22, 1912, Kafka wrote the story Das Urteil, The Judgment, literally, The Verdict, and dedicated it to Felice Bauer. Broad noted the similarity in names of the main character and his fictional fiancé, Georg Bendemann and Frieda Brandenfeld, to Franz Kafka and Felice Bauer. The story is often considered Kafka's breakthrough work. It deals with the troubled relationship of a son and his dominant father facing a new situation after the son's engagement. Kafka later described writing it as a complete opening of body and soul, a story that evolved as a true birth, covered with filth and slime. The story was first published in Leipzig in 1912 and dedicated to Miss Felice Bauer, and in subsequent editions for F. In 1912, Kafka wrote Die Verwandlung, The Metamorphosis, or The Transformation, Published in 1915 in Leipzig. The story begins with a traveling salesman waking to find himself transformed into a, a monstrous vermin, being a general term for unwanted and unclean animals. Critics regard the work as one of the seminal works of fiction of the 20th century. The story in Der Strafe Colony, in the Penal Colony, dealing with an elaborate torture and execution device, was written in October 1914, revised in 1918 and published in Leipzig during October 1919. The story Ein Hunger Künstler, a hunger artist, published in the periodical in 1924, describes a victimized protagonist who experiences a decline in the appreciation of his strange craft of starving himself for extended periods. His last story, Josephine, Die Century Noter das Volk der Maas, Josephine the Singer, or the Mouse Folk, also deals with the relationship between an artist and his audience. He began his first novel in 1912, its first chapter is the story Der Heitzer, The Stoker. Kafka called the work, which remained unfinished, The Man Who Disappeared or The Missing Man, but when Broad published it after Kafka's death he named it America. The inspiration for the novel was the time spent in the audience of Yiddish theater the previous year, bringing him to a new awareness of his heritage, which led to the thought that an innate appreciation for one's heritage lives deep within each person.
more explicitly humorous and slightly more realistic than most of Kafka's works, the novel shares the motif of an oppressive and intangible system putting the protagonist repeatedly in bizarre situations. It uses many details of experiences of his relatives who had emigrated to America and is the only work for which Kafka considered an optimistic ending. During 1914, Kafka began the novel, The Trial, the story of a man arrested and prosecuted by a remote, inaccessible authority, with the nature of his crime revealed neither to him nor to the reader. Kafka did not complete the novel, although he finished the final chapter. According to Nobel Prize winner and Kafka scholar Elias Canetti, Felice is central to the plot of Dare Process and Kafka said it was her story. Canetti titled his book on Kafka's letters to Felice Kafka's other trial, in recognition of the relationship between the letters and the novel. Michiko Kakutani notes in a review for the New York Times that Kafka's letters have the earmarks of his fiction, the same nervous attention to minute particulars, the same paranoid awareness of shifting balances of power, the semi atmosphere of emotional suffocation, combined, surprisingly enough, with moments of boyish ardor and delight. According to his diary, Kafka was already planning his novel, The Castle, by June 11, 1914, however, he did not begin writing it until January 27, 1922. The protagonist is the land surveyor, named Kay, who struggles for unknown reasons to gain access to the mysterious authorities of a castle who govern the village. Kafka's intent was that the castle's authorities notify Kay on his deathbed that his legal claim to live in the village was not valid, yet, taking certain auxiliary circumstances into account, he was to be permitted to live and work there. Dark and at times surreal. The novel is focused on alienation, bureaucracy, the seemingly endless frustrations of man's attempts to stand against the system, and the futile and hopeless pursuit of an unobtainable gold. Hartmut M. Rastelsky noted in his thesis, like dreams, his texts combine precise realistic detail with absurdity, careful observation and reasoning on the part of the protagonists with inexplicable obliviousness and carelessness. Kafka's stories were initially published in literary periodicals. His first eight were printed in 1908 in the first issue of the bi-monthly Hyperion. Franz Bly published two dialogues in 1909 which became part of Beschreibung eines Kampfs, Description of a Struggle. A fragment of the story Die Aeroplane in Brescia, The Aeroplanes at Brescia, written on a trip to Italy with Broad, appeared in the Daily Bohemia on 28 September 1909. On March 27, 1910, Several stories that later became part of the book were published in the Easter edition of Bohemia. In Leipzig during 1913, Broad and publisher Kurt Wolf included, The Judgment, a story by Franz Kafka, in their literary yearbook for the art poetry Arcadia. In the same year, Wolf published Der Heitzer, The Stoker, in the Jung's text series, where it enjoyed three printings. The story, Before the Law, was published in the 1915 New Year's edition of the Independent Jewish Weekly. It was reprinted in 1919 as part of the story collection, A Country Doctor, and became part of the novel. Other stories were published in various publications, including Martin Buber's Dare Jude, The Paper, and The Periodicals, Genius, and Prager Pressa. Kafka's first published book, Contemplation, or Meditation, was a collection of 18 stories written between 1904 and 1912. On a summer trip to Weimar, Broad initiated a meeting between Kafka and Kurt Wolf. Wolf published in the At the End of 1912, with the year given as 1913. Kafka dedicated it to Broad, and added in the personal copy given to his friend, as it is already printed here, for my dearest Max. Kafka's story Die Verwandlung, The Metamorphosis, was first printed in the October 1915 issue of, a monthly edition of Expressionist Literature, edited by René Schickley. Another story collection, A Country Doctor, was published by Kurt Wolf in 1919, dedicated to Kafka's father. Kafka prepared a final collection of four stories for print, A Hunger Artist, which appeared in 1924 after his death, in. On April 20, 1924, the published Kafka's essay on Adalbert Stifter. Kafka left his work, both published and unpublished, to his friend and literary executor Max Broad with explicit instructions that it should be destroyed on Kafka's teeth, Kafka wrote, Dearest Max, my last request, everything I leave behind me. In the way of diaries, manuscripts, letters, my own and others, sketches, and so on, is, to be burned unread. 
Fraud ignored this request and published the novels and collected works between 1925 and 1935. He took many papers, which remain unpublished, with him in suitcases to Palestine when he fled there in 1939. Kafka's last lover, Dora Diamond, later, Diamond Lask, also ignored his wishes, secretly keeping 20 notebooks and 35 letters. These were confiscated by the Gestapo in 1933, but scholars continue to search for them. As Broad published the bulk of the writings in his possession, Kafka's work began to attract wider attention and critical acclaim. Broad found it difficult to arrange Kafka's notebooks in chronological order. One problem was that Kafka often began writing in different parts of the book, sometimes in the middle, sometimes working backwards from the end. Broad finished many of Kafka's incomplete works for publication. For example, Kafka left with unnumbered and incomplete chapters and with incomplete sentences and ambiguous content. Broad rearranged chapters, copy edited the text, and changed the punctuation. Appeared in 1925 in. Kurt Wolf published two other novels, in 1926 and America in 1927. In 1931, Broad edited a collection of prose and unpublished stories as The Great Wall of China, including the story of the same name. The book appeared in the Broad sets are usually called the definitive editions. In 1961, Malcolm Pasley acquired most of Kafka's original handwritten work for the Oxford Bodleian Library. The text for was later purchased through auction and is stored at the German Literary Archives in Marbach am Neckar, Germany. Subsequently, Pasley headed a team, including Gerhard Neumann, Joost Schillemiet and Jürgen Born, which reconstructed the German novels, republished them. Pasley was the editor for, published in 1982, and, published in 1990. Joost Schillemiet was the editor of, published in 1983. These are called the Critical Editions or the Fisher Editions. When Broad died in 1968, he left Kafka's unpublished papers, which are believed to number in the thousands, to his secretary Esther Hoffa. She released or sold some, but left most to her daughters, Eva and Ruth, who also refused to release the papers. A court battle began in 2008 between the sisters and the National Library of Israel which claimed these works became the property of the nation of Israel when Broad emigrated to British Palestine in 1939. Esther Hoffa sold the original manuscript of for 2 million US dollars in 1988 to the German Literary Archive Museum of Modern Literature in Marbach am Neckar. Only Eva was still alive as of 2012. A ruling by a Tel Aviv family court in 2010 held that the papers must be released and a few were, including a previously unknown story, but the legal battle continued. The Hoffs claim the papers are their personal property, while the National Library argues they are cultural assets belonging to the Jewish people. The National Library also suggests that Broad bequeathed the papers to them in his will. The Tel Aviv Family Court ruled in October 2012 that the papers were the property of the National Library. The poet W. H. Auden called Kafka the Dante of the 20th century. The novelist Vladimir Nabokov placed him among the greatest writers of the 20th century. Gabriel Garcia Marquez noted the reading of Kafka's The Metamorphosis showed him that it was possible to write in a different way. A prominent theme of Kafka's work, first established in the short story Da Sertil, is fathers and conflict, the guilt induced in the son is resolved through suffering and atonement. Other prominent themes and archetypes include alienation, physical and psychological brutality, characters on a terrifying quest and mystical transformation. Kafka's style has been compared to that of Kleist as early as 1916, in a review of Die Verwandlung and Der Heitzer by Oskar Walsall in Berliner Beidrige. The nature of Kafka's prose allows for varied interpretations and critics have placed his writing into a variety of literary schools. Marxists, for example, have sharply disagreed over how to interpret Kafka's works. Some accused him of distorting reality whereas others claimed he was critiquing capitalism. The hopelessness and absurdity common to his works are seen as emblematic of existentialism. Some of Kafka's books are influenced by the Expressionist movement, though the majority of his literary output was associated with the experimental modernist genre. Kafka also touches on the theme of human conflict with bureaucracy. William Burroughs claims that such work is centered on the concepts of struggle, pain, solitude, and the need for relationships. Others, such as Thomas Mann, see Kafka's work as allegorical a quest, metaphysical in nature, for God. According to Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, the themes of alienation and persecution, although present in Kafka's work, have been overemphasized by critics. They argue Kafka's work is more deliberate and subversive, and more joyful, 
that may first appear. They point out that reading the Kafka work while focusing on the futility of his character's struggles reveals Kafka's play of humor, he is not necessarily commenting on his own problems, but rather pointing out how people tend to invent problems. In his work, Kafka often created malevolent, absurd worlds. Kafka read drafts of his works to his friends, typically concentrating on his humorous prose. The writer Milan Kundera suggests that Kafka's surrealist humor may have been an inversion of Dostoyevsky's presentation of characters who are punished for a crime. In Kafka's work a character is punished although a crime has not been committed. Kundera believes that Kafka's inspirations for his characteristic situations came both from growing up in a patriarchal family and living in a totalitarian state. Attempts have been made to identify the influence of Kafka's legal background and the role of law in his fiction. Most interpretations identify aspects of law and legality as important in his work, in which the legal system is often oppressive. The law in Kafka's works, rather than being representative of any particular legal or political entity, is usually interpreted to represent a collection of anonymous, incomprehensible forces. These are hidden from the individual but controlled lives of the people, who are innocent victims of systems beyond their control. Critics who support this absurdist interpretation cite instances where Kafka describes himself in conflict with an absurd universe, such as the following entry from his diary. However, James Hawes argues many of Kafka's descriptions of the legal proceedings in metaphysical, absurd, bewildering and nightmarish as they might appear, are based on accurate and informed descriptions of German and Austrian criminal proceedings of the time which were inquisitorial rather than adversarial. Although he worked in insurance, as a trained lawyer Kafka was keenly aware of the legal debates of his day. In an early 21st century publication that uses Kafka's office writings as its point of departure, Patek Ghosh states that with Kafka, law has no meaning outside its fact of being a pure force of domination and determination. The earliest English translations of Kafka's works were by Edwin and Willem Muir, who in 1930 translated the first German edition of this was published as The Castle by Secker and Warburg in England and Alfred A. Knopf in the United States. A 1941 edition, including a homage by Thomas Mann, spurred a surge in Kafka's popularity in the United States during the late 1940s. The Muirs translated all shorter works that Kafka had seen fit to print, they were published by Shokin Books in 1948 as, including additionally the first long train journey, written by Kafka and Broad, Kafka's a novel about youth. A review of Felix Sternheim's Die Geschichte der Jungen Oswald, his essay on Kleist's anecdotes, his review of the literary magazine Hyperion, and an epilogue by Broad. Later editions, notably those of 1954, Dearest Father. Stories and other writings, included text, translated by Anya Wilkins and Ernst Kaiser, which had been deleted by earlier publishers. Known as definitive editions, they include translations of The Trial, Definitive, The Castle, Definitive, and other writings. These translations are generally accepted to have a number of biases and are considered to be dated in interpretation. Published in 1961 by Shokin Books, Parables and Paradoxes presented in a bilingual edition by Nahum and Glazer selected writings, drawn from notebooks, diaries, letters, short fictional works, and the novel Dare Process. New translations were completed and published based on the recompiled German text of Pasley and Shilomi at the Castle, critical by Mark Harriman. Shokin Books, 1998, The Trial, Critical by Breon Mitchell, Shokin Books, 1998, and America, The Man Who Disappeared by Michael Hoffman, New Directions Publishing, 2004. Kafka often made extensive use of a characteristic particular to the German language which permits long sentences that sometimes can span an entire page. Kafka's sentences then deliver an unexpected impact just before the full stop. This being the finalizing meaning and focus. This is due to the construction of subordinate clauses in German which require that the verb be positioned at the end of the sentence. Such constructions are difficult to duplicate in English, so it is up to the translator to provide the reader with the same, or at least equivalent, effect found in the original text. German's more flexible word order and syntactical differences provide for multiple ways in which the same German writing can be translated into English. An example is the first sentence of Kafka's The Metamorphosis which is crucial to the setting and understanding of the entire story. Another difficult problem facing translators is how to deal with the author's intentional use of ambiguous idioms and words that have several meanings which results in phrasing that is difficult to translate precisely. One such instance is found in the first sentence of the metamorphosis. English translators often render the word as insect, in Middle German, however, 
literally means an animal unclean for sacrifice, in today's German it means vermin. It is sometimes used colloquially to mean bug a very general term, unlike the scientific insect. Kafka had no intention of labeling Gregor, the protagonist of the story, as any specific thing, but instead wanted to convey Gregor's disgust at his transformation. Another example is Kafka's use of the German noun in the final sentence of Das Erdhill. Literally, means intercourse and, as in English, can have either a sexual or a non sexual meaning. In addition, it is used to mean transport or traffic. The sentence can be translated as, at that moment an unending stream of traffic crossed over the bridge. The double meaning of Verkir is given added weight by Kafka's confession to Broad that when he wrote that final line, he was thinking of a violent ejaculation. Unlike many famous writers, Kafka is rarely quoted by others. Instead, he is noted more for his visions and perspective. Shimon Sandbank, a professor, literary critic, and writer, identifies Kafka as having influenced Jorge Luis Borges, Albert Camus, Eugène Ionesco, J. M. Coetzee, and Jean Paul Sartre. A Financial Times literary critic credits Kafka with influencing José Saramago, and Al Silverman, a writer and editor, states that J.D. Salinger loved to read Kafka's works. In 1999 a committee of 99 authors, scholars, and literary critics ranked in the second and ninth most significant German language novels of the 20th century. Sandbank argues that despite Kafka's pervasiveness, his enigmatic style has yet to be emulated. Neil Christian Pages, a professor of German studies and comparative literature at Binghamton University who specializes in Kafka's works, says Kafka's influence transcends literature and literary scholarship, it impacts visual arts, music, and popular culture. Harry Steinhauer, a professor of German and Jewish literature, says that Kafka has made a more powerful impact on literate society than any other writer of the 20th century. Broad said that the 20th century will one day be known as the century of Kafka. Michel André Bossi writes that Kafka created a rigidly inflexible and sterile bureaucratic universe. Kafka wrote in an aloof manner full of legal and scientific terms. Yet his serious universe also had insightful humor, all highlighting the irrationality at the roots of a supposedly rational world. His characters are trapped, confused, full of guilt, frustrated, and lacking understanding of their surreal world. Much of the post-Kafka fiction, especially science fiction, follow the themes and precepts of Kafka's universe. This can be seen in the works of authors such as George Orwell and Ray Bradbury. The following are examples of works across a range of literary, musical, and dramatic genres which demonstrate the extent of cultural influence. The term Kafkaesque is used to describe concepts and situations reminiscent of his work, particularly, The Trial, and Die Verwandlung, The Metamorphosis. Examples include instances in which bureaucracies overpower people, often in a surreal, nightmarish milieu which evokes feelings of senselessness, disorientation, and helplessness. Characters in a Kafkaesque setting often lack a clear course of action to escape a labyrinthine situation. Kafkaesque elements often appear in existential works, but the term has transcended the literary realm to apply to real life occurrences and situations that are incomprehensibly complex, bizarre. Or illogical. Numerous films and television works have been described as Kafkaesque, and the style is particularly prominent in dystopian science fiction. Works in this genre that have been thus described include Patrick Bokanowski's 1982 film The Angel, Terry Gilliam's 1985 film Brazil, and the 1998 science fiction film noir, Dark City. Films from other genres which have been similarly described include The Tenant, 1976, and Bart and Fink, 1991. The television series The Prisoner and The Twilight Zone are also frequently described as Kafkaesque. However, with common usage, the term has become so ubiquitous that Kafka scholars note it's often misused. More accurately then, according to author Ben Marcus, paraphrased in what it means to be Kafkaesque by Joe Fassler in The Atlantic, Kafka's quintessential qualities are affecting use of language, a setting that straddles fantasy and reality, and a sense of striving even in the face of bleakness hopelessly and full of hope. The Franz Kafka Museum in Prague is dedicated to Kafka and his work. A major component of the museum is an exhibit the city of K. Franz Kafka in Prague, which was first shown in Barcelona in 1999, moved to the Jewish Museum in New York City, and was finally established in 2005 in Prague in Malastrana, lesser town, along the Moldau. The museum calls its display of original photos and documents Mesto K. Franz Kafka Praha. City K. Kafka in Prague, 
and aims to immerse the visitor into the world in which Kafka lived and about which he wrote. The Franz Kafka Prize is an annual literary award of the Franz Kafka Society in the city of Prague established in 2001. It recognizes the merits of literature as humanistic character and contribution to cultural, national, language and religious tolerance, its existential, timeless character, its generally human validity, and its ability to hand over a testimony about our times. The selection committee and recipients come from all over the world but are limited to living authors who have had at least one work published in the Czech language. The recipient receives $10,000, a diploma, and a bronze statue at a presentation in Prague's Old Town Hall on the Czech state holiday in late October. San Diego State University, SDSU, operates the Kafka Project, which began in 1998 as the official international search for Kafka's last writings. Newspapers, online sources, journals. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.